we've now seen cases start to, uh, to fall. Um, but then we began, now we're starting to see cases and um, uh, going spiking back up with um, cases spreading now into the, um, into the middle regions of the country. Um, as there were no clear messaging on, um, on uh, social distancing and wearing, wearing masks. Um, New York, um, my state, which was hardest hit, um, people died in nursing homes, and we, we all heard the stories about bodies um, piling up in morgues. Um, uh, but we finally did get the COVID rates down to um, less than 1%. But, co but cancer doesn't stop for COVID. And as this pandemic ravaged the nation, and as healthcare providers had to make tough decisions as to how to manage cancer patients who are recently diagnosed, going through treatment, um, uh, and also how to handle um, patients that needed to undergo screening, their routine annual screening. Um, we had tough decisions to make. And so this webinar is gonna explore all these issues as it relates to breast cancer. And, and we have a wonderful panel um, of fabulous speakers, as well as our own navigators here from um, NYU Langone, our own um, breast welter, Beatrice Welter's Breast Health Outreach and Navigation Program here um, to discuss all of these issues. And so um, what I'd like to do is kick it off with our first speaker, um, Dr. Lucille Adams Campbell. <laughs> who's gonna go first. Um, I'll just give a quick introduction. She's the Associate Director for Minority Health and Health Disparities Research, um, as well as the Senior Associate Dean for Community Outreach and Engagement and Professor of Oncology at the Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center at Georgetown University Medical Center. Um, Dr. Adams Campbell has received numerous awards and honors, including the election to the National Academy of Medicine and the induction into the DC Hall of Fame for her research focus on health disparities. And she's received gold medallions awarded from both of her alma maters, the University of Pittsburgh and Drexel University for outstanding contributions to the field of public health and social sciences and her areas of research focus on addressing health disparities um, with emphasis on clinical trials and cancers that disproportionately Im impact minority and underserved populations, especially African Americans. Dr. Adams Campbell conducts research in the areas of obesity, metabolic syndromes, and energy balance. And um, she has published numerously. Um, so, Dr. Adams Campbell, I'm going to let you take it from there. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. I was getting ready to ask who was going first. Me or Dr. Paskett. So now I know the answer. So let me tell you a little bit about Georgetown Lombardi Comprehensive Cancer Center. I think it will set the stage for the discussion about patient navigation. First of all, our catchment area is not just DC. And I have to admit, before I became, before I joined Georgetown, it was only DC. But now in the catchment area is DC, Maryland, and Virginia, those neighboring counties. And it's important for those in New York to know that we are a consortium with the John Thurer Cancer Center in Hackensack, New Jersey. And that brings a lot of discussion up immediately. Why is Georgetown with, with New Jersey? And we'll discuss that later. But the counties that are involved there are Hudson, Passaic, and Bergen County. So I know with New York institutions, there's overlap in many entities and many ways we can probably partner after you hear it about, we now are in Hackensack as well. So I just want to talk about our navigators from the perspective of in the midst of COVID. And talking about it, we were focusing on the social determinants of health, just in general, the bigger picture. When you think about the social determinants of health, you think about access, transportation, insurance, primary care physicians, and race, whether people speak in language, whether people speak English, whether they're a minority that feel like that's a barrier for them, or they treat it as though it's a barrier. But I think now we need to move into this new realm where we think that COVID-19 becomes another social determinant of health because it elicits fear, fear into many people. It almost becomes so much polarizing that you can almost equate it to people having the fear of cancer. The fear of COVID and the fear of cancer, to me, are almost synonymous in certain settings because Sometimes having a diagnosis or think you might have a diagnosis of cancer paralyzes you. But now you can't even go and mobilize yourself to get screened, treated, diagnosed because of this fear. So I'm really advocating for us to talk, start talking about 
COVID-19 as another social determinant of health because it's going to have such a long lasting impact on everyone because of what's going to happen when we now we've worked so hard to shift the curve to the left earlier screening getting your treatment done at a one time schedule and now with this COVID we're seeing the delays in treatment we're seeing the delays in screening so we expect to see a shift in the curve to the right where we'll have more if not advanced cancers but definitely fewer early stage cancers and that to me is a major health issue that's going to warrant a lot of attention and i think that we also have to not only focus on the social determinant of health but really see how it's going to impact and i think research is going to focus on how did COVID really impacts I think our outcomes will change during this period. If we look at pre-COVID and post-COVID, we're gonna see that there are gonna be significant differences. And I think that's gonna to be to our detriment. But when I think about the navigators, how they operate, in general, our community-based navigators are hands-on people. They're in the field. They actually usher and nurture people and get them through their education all the way and hand off in the clinic setting. But where's teleworking still at Georgetown? So our navigators are operating from a remote perspective. They're using phone, Zoom, all these other media modes of operation to communicate than before. But what is it important for them to do? They still must get people screened. And what's the biggest issue that comes to mind when we talk about navigating people to mammography screening? or colon screening, or whatever it is we have to navigate them to. First, the university's hospitals all closed screening. That was the first thing that was shut down when COVID hit, no screenings. So people who would do, or do for diagnostics, do for anything, they were not allowed to be screened. So you have to really think about that. So it was a substantial period of time. And when people have cancer, or you're fearing from that diagnosis of cancer, you really need something immediate. But then once it opened, the screening services open, it was tough for the navigators to navigate people to screening because now they were afraid to go to any hospital setting because only thing that you saw in the news was all about COVID. Everything was COVID. The hospitals had, were overrun with COVID. So why did anybody who did not have an illness want to go to the hospital? And you still have to educate and navigate you know, once we got to a safe zone, that getting people involved in that. So our navigators did end up increasing people to screening and scheduling more and more people because now I think they have caught up in their minds that they can get screened and do the things that they need to do. And we do more virtual educational programs so that with the communities, the community organizations, the community partners, so that they can see who and what should be happening. And I think that has been a very big hit for us doing more of the virtual. Actually, the virtual, such as this webinar, they're becoming more popular. I know that we will never go back to doing things the way we did before COVID because it becomes sometimes much more efficient. But oftentimes, you still need to have that hands-on approach to people. And I think we get to that as well. One thing that we're really proud of at Georgetown is our Health Justice Alliance program that really needs the navigator. The Health Justice Alliance program with, it, it's really a part of our, or a part of our medical legal partnership. And I think this is key because with COVID really in full effect, and they're expecting an increased number of cases of COVID very soon, it's, this medical legal partnership is gonna be very important. If you don't understand the medical legal partnership, this is how it impacts people. If a cancer patient, loses their job during COVID. They need to have their treatment. They become evicted or, or, or receive an unlawful eviction notice. Their worries are now rerouted towards saving, preserving their house, keeping their electricity on because they can cut the electricity off and the gas off. There have been some provisions made nationally so that people wouldn't lose them. But for others, they don't understand all those rules. And our navigators navigate those patients that are in 
financial, that we call it financial toxicity, that are suffering from financial toxicity to the lawyers at Georgetown that have set up this health justice alliance. And once we realize that once they send one legal letter from Georgetown Law Center to the landlord or to the electric company or to the gas company, there's no problem. So can you imagine they're getting a pro bono lawyer to help resolve their case, and then they can go back to their treatment. So I think this Health Justice Alliance is just really important. And I think it's something that we can talk about a little bit more about, but I think that people didn't know that they had rights. And I think it's important for the cancer patients to really understand they have legal rights. And Georgetown is addressing that through this um, Health Justice Alliance. Also, you know, there's a study out, and you probably are aware of it, called T-MIST, a mammography screening clinical trial. And we are now getting our patients back into screening. And one thing that our navigators are really focusing on, this is a study that will allow women, and it tests 2D, 3D for advanced, for advanced cancers, but it will allow women to participate, particularly minority women, in clinical trials when they've never done it before. And their participation in clinical trials is so important because they become a part of the solution and that always considered a part of the problem. They're participating actively and we're able to now increase our enrollment to clinical trials during this period, which is, is odd, but it's happening. Our navigators are asking, hey, would you like to participate in a clinical trial? You were scheduled to have your mammogram anyhow. And we're not gonna stop you from having your mammogram. Even if you say, well, I only wanna do 3D and you get mandomized to 2D. On the off year, you still can get 3D. So you still can do things to keep people involved. So for me, the most important thing there is increasing the number of minorities, particularly blacks and Hispanics into clinical trials as particularly TMS because some people have to start somewhere. So this is right in alignment with where a lot of the women were going. It's time for us to go back to screening. So I think that has been very helpful. I think I'll stop there because in general, our navigators are navigating for the research for clinical trials, and that's back on track. For financial toxicity, that's back on track. For treatment, to make certain that they're getting their schedules and appointment for, for um, their care that's needed, and trying to allay their fears and saying how the hospitals and their settings that they must go to are doing all the, using all the PPE and doing everything needed to protect them and also protect the, the providers. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Adams Campbell. And um, I really uh, appreciate your, um, your concept of having COVID-19 as a social determinant of health. And we'll explore that further. And we're gonna save all our questions to the end. And I'm gonna move to Dr. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Paskett. Um, Dr. Electra Paskett, is the Marion and Rowley Professor of Cancer Research at The Ohio State University. Uh, she's also the Director of the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control in the College of Medicine, a professor in the Division of Epidemiology in the College of Public Health, and the Associate Director of the Population Sciences and Community Outreach and Co. and the Co-Program Leader of the Cancer Control Program in the Comprehensive Center, Cancer Center of The Ohio State University. She's also Director of the Center for Cancer Health Equity at the James James Cancer Hospital, and she's published numerously on cancer prevention, early detection, and survivorship issues. She's a past president of the American Society of Preventive Oncology, past deputy editor of the journal Cancer, Epidemiology, Biomarkers, and Prevention, and section editor of the journal Cancer. She's a director of the Cancer Control Program and Alliance. In 2016, she was appointed as a member of the National Cancer Institute's National Cancer Advisory Board by President Obama, and in 2019, she was appointed as a member of the Ohio Commission on Minority Health by Governor DeWine. Dr. Paskett? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joseph, and uh, it's just a privilege to be on this panel, and especially to be on the panel with Dr. Adams Campbell, uh, my good friend. So, um, I, I'm going to say some things that are very similar to what you've just heard. But uh, to start with, I want to talk a little bit about um, our catchment area. So I am from the Ohio State University and um, our catchment area for our cancer center is the entire state of Ohio. And I don't know how many of you 
know about Ohio. Um, we have 88 counties in, in our state and uh, 50 of those counties or about 2.4 of the 11.7 million in our state live in uh, rural areas. We also have 32 counties that kind of go along the south and up the east that are part of federally designated Appalachia, which has some socioeconomic challenges um, of its own and uh, healthcare professional shortage areas. So for example, we have five to seven counties that have no mammography facility in the entire county. And uh, there are no means of transportation in those counties as one primary care physician told us, we don't have Uber. that's rural, rural Uber. They don't have that. So, and the, the bus line there, you know, there's no bus line. So transportation is a big problem. And of course there are no big cancer centers there. So folks have to drive um, to Ohio State, West Virginia, uh, or uh, Cleveland, where, wherever they live. The other thing about Ohio, many of you might not um, realize is that we do have a different unique populations. I've already mentioned the rural and Appalachia population, but we do have established and new immigrant communities. And immigrants feel that Columbus especially is a very welcoming um, place for them. There um, are organizations set up to help them assimilate. And so we, we actually have the second highest Somali population in the United States, second highest to uh, Minnesota. And we have uh, uh, immigrants from uh, Bhutan and uh, we have Nepalese, Asian and Hispanic uh, immigrants. So uh, just for the Asian communities we have here in our Columbus area, there are 30 different Asian dialects spoken um, in Columbus. And, and so, um, so, so that gives us a lot of uh, diversity. We also have an Amish population in the rural areas, and we actually have the second per capita largest uh, uh, LGBTQ population in the country. Again, that's per capita. But we, again, um, because uh, they feel that uh, we're a, a welcoming um, uh, community. So um, how do we handle <laughs> This large geographic and diverse population in our in our in our work. Um, well, as uh, Dr. Joseph mentioned, I lead a center for cancer health equity, and in that center, I have 17 staff, and my staff um, represent the diverse populations that we have in Ohio, and I have many bilingual staff. It, it's part of that uh, staff. I have six patient navigators that um, work in a variety of, of, of clinics and roles, which I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. We also partner with the community. We have over 250 community organizations that we partner with. We have um, an urban community advisory board. We have um, community coalitions that we work with in the Appalachian areas. We have partnerships with fairly qualified health centers throughout the state. And we also have a rural community advisory board that we meet with. So we have a lot of community impact. And um, as Dr. Adams Campbell mentioned, the barriers that our patients face are across the gamut and they vary, of course, by the population. Um, we've talked a little bit about finance, financial, health insurance barriers, transportation, basic needs, food, shelter, utilities, uh, language, big barriers with uh, non-speaking, non-English speaking patients, knowledge, culture, fear. Um, I could tell you, share lots of stories um, uh, for those barriers. The healthcare system itself is a huge barrier, as well as additional comorbidities. So what happens with these barriers just in normal times is the barriers cause our patients to cancel appointments, have no shows, which results in failure to receive their treatment, not adherent to preventive health behaviors, all resulting in poor outcomes. So our solution to addressing this is patient navigation. 
And we, we, all, we already know patient navigation can address a lot of, of these barriers. They can, it can improve follow-up rates, can improve screening rates. It can reduce delays to starting treatment and actually reduce patients who are lost to care. A lot of times our clinics don't know that a certain patient is supposed to come back for a follow-up and that patient becomes lost. So at Ohio State, we uh, have three ways that we implement patient navigation. We implement patient navigation remotely, mainly telephonic, in the clinic, and then across the cancer care continuum in a program we call uh, uh, Continuum of Care Navigation. And all of our navigation programs function under the name of Wayfinder. So um, our remote patient navigation, let's turn now to COVID. So the COVID impact in, um, in Ohio, uh, our, our state shut down pretty soon after everything happened in the country. And we were shut down, um, our clinic shut down, everything shut down for our, uh, several weeks. And all of my staff, we, we, I sent them home on March 16th. We're still working remotely. We're still working from home, but my staff are still working with the populations that they work with. And um, so um, I asked my navigators what some of the challenges were. Um, and sorry, I have to change my glasses so I can read their quotes, okay. So um, one patient navigator said, folks are not getting routine screenings at the same rate due to COVID and they're delaying care. And because we're not in, physically in the clinics, it's difficult for the staff in the clinics to use patient navigation as it was intended. So let's switch now to a patient navigator that deals with our rural populations. Anything that is an issue in urban areas is magnified in rural areas and underserved populations. Access to assistance is becoming harder to find as organizations who have previously had no trouble fundraising are now finding themselves out of money and donations are down. Not to mention that families who have never been in a position to need assistance have now had their rug pulled out from under them with so many losing jobs or facing a cut in their income. And then um, um, uh, in terms of coming to see the doctor, uh, let's see, patients, uh, let's see, patients who were initially scared of going to a doctor's office for any type of visit now have those fears heightened even more. And then I, uh, the last comments, uh, the last quotes I wanna make are um, from my, uh, my navigators that work with the, the immigrant and refugee communities. He said that the immigrant and refugee communities tend to trust patient navigators more when dealing uh, with them personally rather than over the phone or virtually. And for that reason, patient navigators have to spend more time to get patient trust before they discuss any services. So now we're going remotely and we don't have that personal um, interaction. Community health workers used to connect with communities in places of gatherings. Those places are all either closed or have limited community activities and they hardly provide for virtual services. Um, and lastly, people are so afraid to catch COVID-19 from anybody. And for that reason, they tend to be reluctant to accept any outreach approaches. So those are, those are from my staff who are out and interacting with the community. So our first method, the remote method, we mainly use that, we use that a lot for some of our research studies. And we had a very, very, very big study in uh, 90 rural counties. And that was all done telephonically and mailed anyway. So that really didn't have a huge impact, except that the outcome was breast, cervical, or colon screening. And with the clinics closing down across the state, it was hard for the women to go in and get, get their screening. Our second way of the navigation is in-clinic navigation, where my navigators are embedded in the clinic. And I'll give you an example of the breast clinic, where we focus on uh, reduction of no-shows, reduction of cancellation, 
and uh, reducing delays in start of treatment. So um, that was paused for a few weeks um, because patients weren't coming in, but we are back now um, doing remote patient navigation with referrals uh, from the clinics. The other uh, um, in-clinic uh, na navigation that we were doing was financial navigation. So Dr. Adams Campbell talked about financial toxicity. We uh, had a small grant from a foundation to focus on uh, financial navigation and actually give uh, cancer patients who qualified up to $250 in, in uh, aid. We paid a lot of gift, oh, sorry, a lot of utility bills. We were able to give gift cards for gas, for food, for whatever. And um, we were able to, to keep doing that remotely um, until the, the grant ended. And we're now seeking other funds to continue that because the need um, still continues uh, for that. The last type of navigation I mentioned is the, con 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 uh, sorry, it's a, a late in the day, continuum of care navigation, where we work with our community health workers <coughs> who go out into these um, diverse populations. They educate the community about, for example, the need for a mammogram. And once they have educated a woman, a woman is interested in a mammogram, they link the woman with a telephonic navigator who decides how we're gonna pay for that mammogram. Does the woman have insurance or do we need to get her in the marketplace? Or is the breast and cervical cancer early detection program gonna pay for it? Or are we gonna pay for it? Any, any of those possibilities, we work it out. Once we work it out, we figure out where, where is she gonna get screened? Is there a clinic nearby she can go? Is it's the breast and cervical cancer early detection program? Can we get her to one of those clinics? Or is she in an area where we're gonna have a mobile, a mobile mammogram van come and she can, can go there. And we do those a lot in Columbus with the Hispanic community and Somali community. And then in those counties, I told you early on about where there is no mammography facility um, in Appalachia, we set up the van, to the mobile mammogram to, van to go there. And then the navigator, closely connected with the community health worker, make sure the woman doesn't have any barriers to get there, does she have transportation, childcare, et cetera, to get there, make sure she gets there. If there's um, <clears throat> an abnormal, they follow up that ab abnormal through diagnostic resolution or through the treatment. And so uh, that uh, we did in conjunction with a grant from Coleman, and we have, um, um, assisted with over 2,600 mammograms being done and uh, navigated 48 women through uh, the cancer uh, process. So that has been um, extremely uh, good, uh, uh, good use of uh, continuum care navigation. And um, I mentioned the Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. Uh, the, the Ohio Department of Health realized how uh, well, our program was doing in terms of getting women to get mammograms. And they said, hey, we have some zip codes where we know that women aren't getting mammograms and women aren't getting PAPs. And we know that we have women there who could qualify for free mammograms or free PAPs. Could you work in those areas? So we did. And we followed the same thing, continuum of care patient navigation and we increased enrollment into the Ohio Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program by 51% um, in one year. And they were so excited, they've asked us to expand um, in other counties. So the last thing I wanna talk about is, is what specifically we have done in response to COVID. Because um, um, we, we talked about, you know, you have to focus on COVID. You're in the community, you're working with these communities, you have to focus on COVID because they're the last communities to hear the truth and understand what they need to be doing. And so um, the first area we focused on was education. We translated a lot of materials, in, including for the medical center, into a minimum of six languages that are now um, available. We provided COVID-19 education to the community. Some of our communities uh, would have calls in the evening, 400 community residents on these calls. 
And so our community health workers joined the calls and um, um, provided real information, provided reasons why community owned businesses needed to close because that was the governor's mandate. Address cultural concerns during COVID about holidays and burial rights. Assisted with created et creating educational videos about COVID. Use specific social media platforms that were used by those populations. And did an op ed in the local newspaper and on, on the website. So education was the one thing. The second thing was outreach. We already did outreach, but we sort of changed. Uh, a lot of the flavor of our outreach and the topics. Um, my community health workers did uh, uh, calls to underserved communities as well as did the patient navigators from those communities, the Somali, Nepalese, and Hispanic community, speaking to them in their language. They, had, they followed up on the businesses that had not closed. I, I mentioned that just a minute ago and provided connection and resources for PPP loans. They also assisted with filing for unemployment for those people in the community. Uh, we distributed free masks and community care kits. These were developed by the uh, university and we went out in the vans, just stood on street corners in these communities and, and handed out these kits. We have a mobile van for the, the university that was used to do COVID-19 testing. And again, my staff, my bilingual staff uh, would, would uh, join that van. And then we connected the community to resources, resources that they needed at this time, such as internet, tutoring for children at home, food pantries, and domestic violence resources. And then the third thing we focused on was community-based research. We are right now um, in the process of surveying uh, up to 10,000 community residents in the state of Ohio through a supplement we got. Um, and we are part of the NCI COVID-19 survey consortium. There are now 15 cancer centers part of that. We have almost 8,000 here at Ohio now have completed that. We participated in a survey, well, our our fellow qualified health centers that we work with participated in a survey that the Virginia Commonwealth University was doing. And uh, one of my staff monitors all the COVID-19 related policies at the state level, county level, um, and university levels. Two of our faculty um, participated, um, uh, well, actually worked very closely with the Ohio Department of Health and formed these work groups uh, that assessed barriers and strategies to COVID testing in vulnerable populations. And um, they just released this report last week. It's a, over a 400 page document, very, very extensive in terms of who the vulnerable populations are and what the issues are from the mouths of these populations and what the strategies are to reach these populations with education and testing. And then using that information, we were successful in obtaining one of the NIH Rad X up large network grants so that we can we can use all of our experience and our network and our community health workers, our navigators to reach these, to actually reach these vulnerable populations in 12 counties in Ohio with information about COVID, education, testing, contact tracing assistance with social determinants of health for those who uh, test positive, um, et cetera. So that um, we'll be rolling that live. Our plan is in January, but it's all because of the experience and the networks that we have developed um, through the Center for Cancer Health Equity. So um, I think I'll stop here and um, be happy to join in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alana, for that wonderful overview of your your program at um, at Ohio State. Um, there's a lot to um, take in there. And um, what before we go to Q and A, um, and so that we can delve a little bit more into um, uh, both um, your program and um, Dr. Adams Campbell, I'd like to introduce 
um, two of our veteran um, navigators from um, our Welters Navigation Program here at uh, NYU. Um, uh, first, I'd like to introduce uh, Sheila Willis. She's actually our first navigator that we hired. Um, uh, and, um, and then Jackie Pierre Lewis, um, also one of our uh, veteran navigators. Um, you want to say hello, Sheila? And good afternoon. So I'm happy to um, invite you uh, to participate. Um, as being a navigator, listening to um, the, uh, the first two presenters with regards to um, the overcoming some of the barriers or the things that were faced um, during the time of uh, the beginning of COVID. Um, definitely, we face those same issues. Um, what I did, um, what I do love about our program, um, although it's an NYU program, we are able to service the five boroughs, and um, and so we're not restricted to uh, being in one place or location or, or trying to fulfill the need of someone that is that is reaching out to us. So. That's the uniqueness, and I really do appreciate being able to have that um, bandwidth to be able to do those things. Um, we, you know, we had to reorganize and step back a little bit when um, COVID first hit because it was kind of surreal. You know, like, are we really, you know, really? Do we all really have to go home? And you know, can what are we going to do, or how are we going to be able to do this? And as um, Dr. Joseph said, it was a uh, restriction put on certain things that you could and couldn't do, uh, especially in the health and hospital setting um, throughout the city. So kind of all other ailments took a standstill, although people still were experiencing whatever they were experiencing, other illnesses outside of that. So the need was still there. And how do you re reorganize to um, get the needs met? Um, the good thing is that we we have a lot of um, great relationships with other organizations, although some of those organizations were not running as well. Everything was at a standstill. So one of the things we were able to do, unless it was a, uh, an area outside of screening mammograms, basically we collected all information so that once uh, things opened up to allow for normal screening um, services to happen. We were we were able to pick up and um, connect with those people. Outside of that, we still were able to manage to get um, women who contacted us, and surprisingly, a lot of other organizations that were not running were reaching out to us. Are you working? Are you you know we we had we were still working, but we just weren't able to get screenings done at the at the time. Um, so a lot of those women that did have issues outside of normal and had symptoms, we were able to, um, you know, get them seen through having, um, direct, um, partnerships and relationships with the institutions that we, uh, work closely with, um, here in New York city. So that helped a lot being able to do that. And, um, and I think that gave us a lot more credibility credibility and respect. Um, and what I did find is that I was, was able to help patients that contacted me with problems or needing screenings in giving them information in addition to outside of what they needed. So a lot of patients, because they lost their jobs, were on, an, on unemployment, no longer had health insurance. With this one fact, um, a lot of women, most of the women that I was that I connected with that were in need of services, got were were able to get them um, get Medicaid, el were eligible because now they were unemployed. They had no um, insurance now. They were not making the same um, money either collecting unemployment or had no source of income. So. Um, it it helped them in the long run. So it was an encouragement for me to, you know, they were very grateful because they never thought of this turn of events would also would help them in another way, um, even though it was a, a adverse thing that they were going through. So, um, you know, I, I met a woman who just needed a screening mammogram 
at the time she was referred to by one of uh, uh, one of our um, people that we partner with or that refer other women to us. And so as soon as we were up and running, I was able to get her seen and um, screened. And at the same time, I was able to, to direct her and instruct her with information for her to apply for um, medical insurance. And she was so grateful because she never, at the time, she was also in that gray area of um, Obamacare where it was too much, too, very expensive for her to pay. And then um, the deductible was high. So it wasn't affordable for her as well at the time. But this change was, allowed her to uh, get some additional resources and help. So while it was a, neg a negative thing of COVID, there was a little bit of positivity that has been coming out of, of this situation for some, some women. That's great, Sheila. So you were able to sort of not only help, uh, help navigate some of these women for their screening or other resources, but you're able to help them get other resources that they didn't even expect to get while you right. were navigating them. So that's yeah. wonderful. Um, Jackie, do you want to introduce yourself and say a few words? You're still muted. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jackie, Jackie Pierre Lewis. Um, I'm actually one of the breast health navigators with the Welters program. Um, I can totally identify with everything that our previous presenter said, um, Dr. Adams Campbell, Dr. Pasquette, and Sheila. Um, and it's definitely true that we can definitely see COVID-19 as a new social determinant of health. That's for sure. So not to reiterate uh, what was said before, as far as having access to the services, um, the new financial issues that are arising as a result of COVID. Um, I think part of the, one of the things with COVID that I think I had discussed before you know, in the past was having experienced COVID-19 kind of forced us to really up our game in the sense that we were used to having several organizations that we were working with. Most of them closed their doors. So it really pushed us to look out there to see what else was out there that we can offer our patients. So in the process of COVID, um, our former partners who were no, no longer able to serve um, their patients were able to refer some of them to us. But we also discovered so much more out there that we could actually offer um, to our patients. So that was at least one positive thing. Um, as far as most of the patients that I deal with are mostly undocumented. Um, it, it might seem a little, there was a little bit of so much focus on COVID that there was less focus on immigration for them um, in the sense that it was COVID was, was what was being talked of, of all across the board. And we, didn't, we were not listening to that whole immigration rhetoric or policy changes that we had been hearing for the past three years. Nevertheless, um, their situation still um, prevented them in a certain way to, um, how do you say, to, to get proper information or access care. For example, some of them had to come from, um, if they had to travel across state lines, for example, they were afraid to come because there was a lot of misinformation as to closing certain borders. So a lot of people thought they would get arrested if they came, let's say, from New Jersey to New York or, or vice versa. And we had to provide a lot of information. There was a lot of information given that had not necessarily anything to do with breast cancer, which is in a way part of what we do. Um, the biggest challenge, um, I think, for a lot of our patients is the lack of um, the fact that we're not physically present. The way we work, there's a lot of nurturing that goes um, into our work. And there's a lot of escorting patients. We, we escort our patients a lot to, to a lot of places. 
Um, and the fact that we're not able to be physically present, for a lot of them, that that was an issue. That was very difficult for them because a lot of them have language barriers. A lot of them have all the other fears that they normally have, you know, changes in immigration policy as far as healthcare is concerned. So they always like to have a navigator with them to help them while they're in a place physically to be able to help them address different issues that might arise because they have a language barrier as well. Um, so that was one of the things that was very difficult. And as far as um, for me as a navigator, I had a couple of patients who were in remission um, who left the country and they had a recurrence while away and there were no flights coming into the US. So they had no way of accessing care in their countries. And unfortunately, I lost some of them. And um, so that was one of the things with COVID as well that was really um, difficult for our patients because some of them who could not stay, did not, could not really afford to extend their visa. So they used their tickets to go back, hoping that they might be able to come back and feeling that, well, you know, we're in remission, maybe we have a little bit more time. And while they were there, they recurred and they were not able to access the care and come back. And it was very hard being on this side um, of the globe, talking to them and feeling really helpless and hearing how helpless they felt and not really being able to help them beyond the the reassuring them and, and trying to provide as much hope and praying that the, the you know, the, the airports reopen soon and that they might be able to come and get the care that they need. So that was also a very, very difficult situation. And also we do, although we normally help our patients address their fears and try to instill hope, I noticed that through COVID, there has been a very high emotional toll on our patients. It's it's magnified. Um, so that also has been an issue that fortunately we've been able to, to address over the phone or via Zoom, even if it's not the same thing. But the fact that our patients know that we're still there, even if it's through different means, that, you know, but we can feel it and we can see that there's, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of fear, and it's, it takes a lot more work to actually get the patients to come and say, hey, trust me, I wouldn't have you go to the hospital if I didn't feel that you needed to do this procedure or you needed to do this treatment. Um, delaying your treatment might be, you know, it might cause more problems. So it's, it's, it's much more difficult to convince people also to get their treatments done and to coming in. But now I, I can see the shift. I think that people feel a little bit more comfortable going uh, to the hospitals and getting their treatments done. And because the hospital is not, is providing more and more and more services, they also feel more comfortable than when, you know, everything was actually done. No, we can't do appointments right now. We can't do this. There's no screening. There's no that. So now because the hospitals are opening up, I feel that there's a little bit a higher sense of confidence and lowered fear as far as going to the hospital. Um, so that's that's pretty much what um, I've experienced other than everything that has been said here today. Um, it's, it's really, you know, the emotional toll for the patients um, and definitely those, a lot of misinformation and also um, the inability to access care if you're outside. Um, you know, if for any reason you leave, you cannot come back and get the care that you need. That's basically it. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, uh, a question for all of you, and I encourage the audience, to, um, if you have questions, you can write them in in the Q&A um, or the chat um, uh, box down at the bottom. Um, when uh, screening reopened, um, how were you able to use your navigators or for Sheila and Jackie, how are you able to encourage um, women to come back and, and reassure um, 
how, how were you able to reassure women that the hospitals were safe? Um, for one, we, we know that the hospitals took every precaution possible to prevent the spread. Um, so definitely we were able to communicate that uh, to our patients, but we also really stressed the need for them to actually get screened. And we really emphasize the fact that early screening is very important mm -hmm. and that it's not, um, it's not wise really to delay screening because then the outcomes may not be the same. It's much better to detect something early than wait off a year or six months or seven months and then to find out that it's something that has progressed and then the outcome is not as good as if you, you came in early. So it's really trying to um, make sure that we, we communicate to the patients, listen, the hospital is taking every step possible to prevent the spread. You know, temperatures are being taken, there's hand sanitizer everywhere, My, masks are provided. Um, so we pretty much, I mean, that's how we, we convince. And some of them know that they need it. And um, so, you know, it's just a matter of saying, hey. And one of the things actually that a lot of people did not want to get screened, even if it was available, that they were afraid of taking public transportation. So you probably realize that our, you know, transportation has been a little bit higher during this period than at other times. So that that's another thing, being able to offer them a means of transportation where they don't feel like they're going to be exposed to a large group of people, that also motivated a lot of people to actually say, okay, you know what? If you're gonna provide that service, okay, I'll take my chances. So that's that's pretty much on my end. Yeah, that was a huge problem in New York City, the subways. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Adams Cam. Oh, sorry, Sheila. Okay. Do you want me to go? Yeah. Sure. Sorry. For, for me, um... okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, for me navigating um, what I try to do um, was usually get the <laughs> meet me that day that I would be in the hospital because a lot of screening programs had not restarted yet, and mostly you could only do them in um, a hospital setting. I would direct them to come to where I was working at and um, work out getting their appointments or at least setting up the um, preliminary, excuse me, I got a little tongue tied. <laughs> setting up preliminary things that they might have to do prior to um, getting seen um, for screening. Like if they needed a referral or they weren't up to date with other aspects. Um, so sometimes we had to um, make them, um, not make them, but bring them in in another way. Um, but still directing them to the ultimate goal of getting the screening. Um, so I would try to get them to come in on, on a day that I would be there. So if I'm there and I'm not afraid to be in the hospital, that makes it a little more easier and trusting for them to, to be able to, to want. To Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Sheila was like the, the warrior. She was embedded and she stayed embedded in our clinic for most of the, the time from the beginning, you know, from February. Because our, our clinic stayed open and you were there still shepherding our cancer patients. Um, Dr. Adams Campbell, did you want to say something? Sure. Uh, we have a Capital Breast Care Center. It's been the home of our navigators for about, what, 14 years now. And our navigators are so well known in our catchment area that there's so much tr trust and faith in that group that once our navigators got to the point of understanding and realizing the safety that was now being afforded in the hospital for the patients, the patients actually trusted yeah. the navigators. So the navigators were teleworking, but we did have embedded in some of the mammography sites, the clinical research coordinators for our clinical trials. So if they didn't see the navigators, they knew they would be navigated by our people that they knew, because we are focusing a lot on adherence, not just, let me just get one mammogram, we're focusing on adherence. So by doing that, we have entrusted, they have entrusted us to really provide them the right advice. So they were handed off to our other 
staff that were embedded within the mammography center. So I think it it worked out well. Right. And, we, and we actually are scheduling and screening more people now than we did the same time last year, pre-COVID. Oh, so that would be interesting to look at. That is great. That yeah. is great. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, came up when we uh, had to deal with this whole pandemic was the patients that were already in the middle of treatment, uh, in the middle of their cancer treatment, and uh, making sure that they didn't fall off the map, um, and also dealing with their fear of COVID, and that they would continue with their chemotherapy and or radiation and so forth. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Paskett, Dr. Adams Campbell, can you share any thoughts on how, I don't know if your, your, your navigators also deal with patients throughout that, um, part of the treatment process. Um, but, um, do you have any thoughts on what your navigators had did, um, in terms of either through telehealth, how they help those patients stay on top of their treatment, um, and make sure that they did, they continue to stay compliant with their care. Well, I, I think sort of the, the solutions that have been uh, mentioned were true also for our navigators. And um, I'll set a, a couple of, of other comments. Um, you know, we have women who had abnormal PAPs, and that's not necessarily cancer treatment, but it's very important to get that followed up. And so a large proportion of the women that our navigators work with there are bilingual. Uh, Spanish speaking. And so our navigators there continued to contact the women, would show up at the colposcopy clinic and, and make sure the women were able to come and address any of the concerns. And as soon as our mobile vans opened up again, um, our staff went back out with the vans, with uh, the appropriate precautions and everything uh, to get the women um, screened. So I think seeing the staff uh, with precautions when it was uh, appropriate to go back in the community, out in the community, really helped uh, really in, 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 in gender trust um, in, along the whole continuum of care. Yeah. We haven't gotten our van back up and running yet because we have a lot of concerns still. So the, our, our navigators who drive our van, um, we're waiting for the right time because we would do groups of particularly Hispanics, the Latina, they wanted to come in as a group and the mammography center would block off a, 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 a hours of time so that they can come in because they like the bonding and coming with their friends from the same community organization. So that's that we're down in that one. We can say that we're absolutely down in that, but we hope to pick that up soon because we want to get our van back on the road because that's really instrumental. Also in promoting more educational programs. The like I said, the virtual is really helping, but everybody, we know there's a digital divide. Everybody doesn't have the same access and we don't have the same access, although we might think this is great, we know for certain that it's not working for everyone. So we have to still address that issue. And I think right now we have to focus on addressing the digital divide because that gap is going to widen in the area or the realm of COVID-19. So I think that's going to be really important. I guess in the work that Dr. Paskett does in the Appalachia area and populations, I think that that's, she does a great job in, in rural rural health. And we struggle in Washington, DC, trying to do what you do in the rural. We struggle because there are pockets of people that we know we need to touch. We need to really touch. And I really hope that we can be really at optimal or maximal capacity very soon. So we talked to we you've all talked about the um the stress and anxiety that has affected all of us um, with the pandemic. Um, how have you um, managed um, the um, the impact that COVID is not COVID nineteen has had on the on our community health workers 
and making sure they don't have burnout um, throughout this pandemic as well, as they're dealing with um, our patients, our clients, and um, all that they have, um, all the additional stress that, and burden that they're dealing with. Well, I can honestly say I'm seeing more mental health days. Mm -hmm. A lot of stress among health workers and that around the stress. When COVID first hit, some people were totally paralyzed. And then there's a stress and anxiety that comes by you teleworking. You know, it's one thing to be at home, another thing to be at home all day, but to go on vacation, out, to take a break, out, to go to the beach, out, miss summer, totally gone. So that's what people are really reeling from, and I hear it. And um, you know, people are getting sick. We're getting people really sick and suffering depression. So all these things are playing out, and people are getting counseling. You know, and I think that's a really important thing. And I think we have to respect that. And you know, when people like me, my staff writes me and says, take it. You know, it's something that you don't play with. I, I, you know, you really don't want to toy with that. You don't want to make any judgment like, why should they take a mental health day? You don't want to do that. I mean, I have somebody now that has shingles. I had shingles a long time ago. So much stress. So many things can happen. Yes, yes, the, the, the chicken pox. Yeah, but your immune system gets even more compromised when you have such anxiety and stress continuously. And then when you worry about your patients, we don't want to lose a patient because of the COVID imp impacting everybody else's psyche. So I think so. I think there's just so many issues. So I haven't stressed out yet, but um, I've been, you know, we sit in front of the computers from what, like six or seven in the morning until sundown. And there's, and for the, the like for us, yeah, <laughs> they, they, they're, they're, they're for us, there is no delineation between work and non-work because you can always go back to your computer and work and right. you don't feel the compulsion to like said, oh, it's time to go look at the debate or something. You know, it's time to do this <laughs> because we cannot delineate between, oh, I get up and go down to my office and I start working, but there's not a time where you stop. You don't drive back home. You don't, there's no break. So yes, we all feel stressed. I mean, we really, we feel stressed. And I think that we really are working harder and more than we did when we went to the office. And that's a problem for me because I thought I was a hard worker, but now I think that there's no stop. It's almost like seven days a week. You, you, you can pray on Sunday, you can do whatever you want, but you still are back at work. And that that's, I want, I've got to figure out how to make that separation. So those are my, those, clearly those are my issues. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. So, so I, I, I want to agree with exactly what Lucille just said. Um, you know, I, I, I'm working harder now than I was before. And I used to travel almost every week and I'm working harder now. It's a 70 hour work week about. And um, it, it, I just did over everything. But I want to say some positive things. Okay. I want to say, I want to really congratulate my staff and um, the supervisors of my staff, because the sup my supervisors of the navigators and on my center, um, I'll just focus on them right now. They do a lot of check-ins with, with people, check-in, uh, how are you doing, do a lot of different check-ins, a lot of communication. We as a group, I have a, a, my, all my staff, about 45 people. And um, you know when, when everybody went home, we made sure people had computers, laptop computers, if they didn't have a desktop to work at home. Some of my staff didn't have Wi-Fi, and we were able to uh, give them boxes so that they could can have Wi-Fi to stay connected. And um, we also tried a variety of things. My staff liked me to write a little note cheery note every week. So I did that and had pictures. And now we've decided to do a newsletter that goes out every month. And um, everybody sort of just uh, contributed to what we should put in this newsletter. And now it's 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 grown really big. 
and we only have two editions, but it's grown because that people love that. They love that connection because it's right. That's exactly what we do. I, I mean, we sit here with Hollywood squares all day on our screens and we, we crave, you know, the personal attention. And so um, we've tried to find these ways to connect and to check on people. And, um, you know, if, if, if you if you need the other thing, you know, I we said the daycares are closed. It's fine, you know, if you have your baby, you have to take care of. So I, I would say I love to see dogs and babies. <laughs> you know, show me. If they say hello to the baby, so that's one stress. You know, you don't want to stress the parents out that oh the baby has to be quiet while you're talking to Doctor Paskett. No, so we did that. The other thing is. You have, your kids are going to be there. You're going to have to help them with school. And so, you know, that's fine. If you need to take two, three hours in the middle of the day to help your kids. Work with your supervisor when you're going to make that time up or, you know, take vacation. So I think being very flexible um, has really helped reduce some of the stress for my staff and. The other thing is job security. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that my staff have a job. And so I will work those 70 hours a week to write grants and to do whatever I need to do to make sure that they all have a job. So that's that's sort of how we've tried to um, address some of, of the stress. Sheila, Jackie, do you have any thoughts on this or comments? Otherwise, I'll move on. Um, I just say that for me, I, I, I have to make personal time for myself um, because at the time when, when COVID first started, I was a caregiver for my, um, my father. And so I had to manage doing that plus work remotely and um so i would find that when when it was quitting time for me i would try to make that be the time and that i would eat at least give myself an hour to myself so that might have been me just walking outside around the park which is a few blocks away from me but i had to give myself something give something back to myself um because you you can sometimes it's a, not an, an intentional thing, but you can build up a feeling of resentment that where what what's for me? Like who's looking who's looking out for me? Who's taking care of me? I'm taking care of everybody. So that was my me time at, at the at the time was to just make sure that I gave myself at least one hour um, every day to to give something back to myself. So for me, um, well, the COVID, when COVID hit, my whole family situation changed. Um, so it was, it was really hard. So I, I always reach out to someone. I always call Sheila. <laughs> I always call Sheila. And when, when, um, there have been a couple of times where I did call the pastoral, um, line at NYU to speak to um, the pastor there. And I treat myself to Reiki from time to time, just to <laughs> make sure that all my points are in line. Uh, so that's basically it. But Sheila has been really great um, as a coworker. I, I call her quite often. She puts me back into the reality and uh, that's just about it. Great. Right. So self care so important. I'm going to switch gears a little bit because we're coming to the end. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are on some a national policy on supporting the work of navigators and um, community health community health workers. Um, should there be should there be reimbursement for the work that navigators do that's been raised before um what are your thoughts on that 
So I want to start. Um, I'm I'm um, on the National Navigation Roundtable of the American Cancer Society, mm -hmm. and one of the platforms we have is to do exactly this. Mm -hmm. And um, this is probably about the third time today. I'm going to say what I am. Uh, I have said what I'm going to say, but uh, that is that um, you know. Patient navigation was written in the Affordable Care Act. We all know that, but there was no provision made for paying for patient navigation. People will say, well, we don't have enough evidence. We have a ton of evidence on patient navigation. My colleagues and I have now written three systematic reviews on patient navigation, and it hasn't changed from the first time we wrote these reviews, which says patient navigation is effective. We now have, cost studies. So the uh, Alabama group published a really nice paper on the cost savings to CMS for patient navigation. We have no excuse at the policy level why there is not a billing code for patient navigation. So uh, my perspective is A, we should have a billing code, a CPT code for patient navigation or and <laughs> institutions should cover the costs of patient navigation. We did some uh, analysis for one of our uh, institutional grants that we got on the cost effectiveness of patient navigation. And um, the return on investment was two to three fold. So, and say an institution, I'm just going to throw out a ballpark number, you know, can invest $60,000 in a pay, patient navigator, salary, fringe, um, overhead, whatever. They will get back two to threefold that investment from what they invest. And where do they get it? From the downstream revenues, as well as the reduction in the no-shows, reduction in cancellations increased number of tests that the patient has. And then the things we haven't even factored into our calculation is it, we know that the patients are very satisfied with navigation, which means they're more satisfied with their care, which means they're going to bring, you know, the rest of their family in and get health care at your institution. All right. So you have navigators. So Lucille, I don't know if this happens at your institution, but your navigators bring revenue into the system. Who gets who gets the the um, the revenue accounted to them? Not the clinical, me. The, not me either. It's the clinical services, right? right? Right. So it doesn't even show that we brought in revenue to the clinical enterprise. It's the clinical sites that are are being counted for it. But it was our navigators that did that. And 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 the patients end up in more than one place. Easily, readily, even right. even as our navigators yes. navigate them, even to our studies, and somebody has a blood pressure that's off the Richter scale, they are navigating into the system. Exactly. You know? So they they downstream looks really good. It's just us that we suffer. That's exactly right. So that's my stance. Overwhelming, yes. And uh, there was a patient navigation act introduced, I don't know, two or three times, but uh, before COVID, you know, it didn't get enough steam and it's, it's going to be buried under everything that's going on right now. Something that can save lives and cost less than these big drugs that we spend millions of dollars on. To that people can't afford, that people can't afford. Right, it, I hear you. Listen to the choir, and would that also include uh, financial navigation um, as well? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, because that we'll need help with that as well. I mean, I've heard another argument that, and uh, you kind of said it um, in passing, Electra, that I've heard another argument that it should not be um, a reimbursable. Um, uh, it should not be reimbursable because then you're not helping the people that it's meant to help. Have you heard that argument? No, no. Okay. What does that? What that. does that mean? What does that mean? Because if you're if you have people that are uninsured, 
then then how then 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 like the, the, the issue is, is well, the, well let me address that for a minute I'm, not me i'm not well, saying no, let, that let, let you me know address that I, for a but that has been told to me Okay. And so I want to get your thoughts on this because I really want to tease this out because we're in this process where we depend on, you know, philanthropic funding and so forth. And we're like, this is ridiculous. This is a great program. And there has to be ways that hospitals can sustain this. And the, you have, you all have your, your, your programs as well. And why do you have to keep like begging and borrowing for money for something that benefits hospitals and you know, not all hospitals necessarily want to continue to, you know, um, fund it themselves when it's benefiting the hospitals. And, you know, I think sometimes this has to do with a little bit of systemic racism. And I say that from the perspective that oftentimes, which is not true, but the, the, the mentality is that you're only navigating the poor, the underinsured, the minorities. No one else. Well, if people really look and think hard, it's not just about minorities. There are so many people across every race, ethnic group that can use the help. Now, the issue that I've heard that's similar, that I, I might even approach it sometimes, when you have people that were uninsured and were navigated through we ours is called Project Wish, but it's supported by the Department of Health from CDC. So I think that's the same program that Electra has in Ohio. Mm -hmm. People have to be uninsured, or they have some other parameters to get free, get taken care of freely for their mammograms or cervical screening. But the navigators take a major role in moving them in. But then we have people that are insured, well insured know exactly where to go. They actually called, they, they actually called us because we were trying to really navigate the people who really, really needed it. And and the the I guess the whiplash or the that we got was, oh well if you're not gonna navigate for us, um, what good are you? You know, and I was like, well what do you want to do? Well we can call ourselves. Okay. But we do sometimes people when they can be independent, I think that's the issue you're getting at. When people, when there is some independence and they really don't need us to navigate them, but they want us to do the work for them because we like you. But no, we know every way to go, but we want you to do it. That's the part that sometimes gets to me when the patient is like, oh, we've been using CBCC, Capital Breast Care Center for 10 years. We know everything to do. We we don't miss anything. We do it anyhow. But if we can't make that call for them, uh, that bothers, I have to admit, that bothers me because I think that they just get annoyed because they think of it as their own personal service when yeah. they're people that really need it. Right. They want to make so it priority. I, mm -hmm. I want to give you another spin on okay. saving money, okay? Right. I can't tell you how many people, and I, I actually today asked my navigator supervisor to get a dollar amount, or uh, if she can, it, you know, at our institution, we're a, a land grant institution, a state institution. So we do not deny care for anybody, right? Mm -hmm. So we have been, instead of women who come in for breast, cervical, screening and then follow up who aren't insured instead of eating the cost my navigators will see if they will qualify the, for the breast and cervical cancer screening program so instead of us pay you know our institution paying for it the 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 breast and cervical cancer screening program pays for it right that's the program right so yep. here's uninsured people but we're finding a way so that the institution doesn't have to eat the cost. So, you know, navigation can do a lot of things. Yeah. Besides bringing in the revenue, it can stop the revenue from leaking. And um, so, uh, and, and the other thing is now, uninsured rates are probably going up. I'm sorry, I haven't paid that close attention. My days are spent on COVID numbers right now. But um, insurance rate, uninsured rates might be going up. But we we were finding that you know under the Affordable Care Act they were they were getting low, 
And, and so that wasn't as big a problem as it was in the past and was probably is now and going to be. But, but again, my navigators are so good. They will find ways to, to create ways to pay for the tests for, for people. And um, institutions don't realize that. So when they're saying that oh, we shouldn't bill for it, they don't understand what they're saying. And and I, I think you know uh, uh, today I know my 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 um, center director. No more. We're not doing this for free anymore, because everybody's making money off of what my stupendous staff is doing, and we're not getting you know noted for it. And uh, so enough, enough. It's so nice to know that we all have the same issues. <laughs> yeah. Lucy loves company. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Jack, I mean, Jackie and Sheila are two of some of our, we all have we have great navigators at our program too, and they're they're fantastic. And I mean, they can share with you some of the some of the um some of the things that they have found. Um, I mean, they're intrepid and they have um I mean, they found so many programs for our patients. I mean, like, I mean, even just like the, I don't know who was that found out about the transportation at Bellevue, um, the car Yay. service. I mean, all of these little things that, um, you know, we do for our patients that I think help our patients that the institution was, I mean, at least in our division, they weren't even aware of um, that are, is saving and, and helping our patients and saving money. Little things like that, um, you know, uh, I mean, they're almost like de facto social workers. In some sense, you know, and what, what's interesting that you said about the social workers is that sometimes. Social workers are referring their patients to us, which is really interesting. Huh. So, <laughs> sometimes we have social workers that are so sometimes we have social workers that are hands on. Oh, we're losing you, Jackie. Oh, well, I'm like, oh, well, let me give you so, yeah. <laughs> They generally think we're either nurses or social workers. So that's really interesting. They call me Nurse Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that show. I'm like, no, I'm not like that, Nurse Jackie. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. But um, but yeah, it would definitely be interesting if if one, if someone were to create a study about the revenue that navigation does bring in, because I I with you mentioning it, it just like I was like, yeah, we do. It's a it's a lot of money that you know had we they not connected to us that revenue the hospital would have never seen, you know, and having credit for it, you know, by an, a certain entity. And showing that value, definitely, you know, they would see the value in it because personally, I believe that if a person has a, a really um, uh, a, a issue of a, a illness that warrants that is very serious, I, I personally believe that every person diagnosed with cancer should have a, a navigator um, to help support them. Um, and as you said, Dr. Joseph, you know, we are de facto social workers because sometimes I'm some in, in my personal experience with social workers. I'm like, I know more than they know, and I do more for myself than they've done for me. You know, so uh, you know, and I'm not taking anything away from them, but oh no, know, they they does help. I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're like, they're making sure our patients are getting to the OR on time. So we have a, you know, you know, we're starting the OR right on time. We're, you know, some of our patients that we know might be a little bit of a flight risk, you know, we're putting them in an Uber, make sure they're getting there. That's, they're not paying for that. Our program is paying for that. You know, they're getting, you know, um, what are the food cards? Uh, if we think there's some food instability, where, you know, they go through the whole barriers assessment. We we deal with all of that too. So yeah, we 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 understand. Um, so uh, I I just really this was a great. We ended on a good good note there. We it was um I think uh, Electra. I just want one thing. Deborah went had to leave, but she put oh. something in the chat. Oh, it says 
I hope your navigators are able to help their clients vote too. And uh, that that yeah. is superb. And yeah. uh, I know I'm, I'm in my yeah, mind formulating an email to my staff about voting and uh, yes. et cetera. I think perfect. We, we've got to do that. Got to get out and vote. Got to get out and vote. So many people, you know, have died for our right to, to vote. And this is one of probably the most important elections ever in this country. Yeah. And we really have got to get out there and vote. Yes, thank you so much for pointing that out. Yes, absolutely. So important. And um, I don't know, I think the, the debate is starting uh, soon. So, um, so we're ending at a good time. <laughs> you guys, wanna, I don't know if you guys really want to watch it or maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stress, did you say stress? <laughs> I don't drink, but maybe tonight. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to watch it through Comedy Central later. <laughs> That's right. Comedy Central will give us a nice review. That's right. I, I really want to thank you all um, for, um, for, for participating on this panel. Um, it was um, it was fabulous. Um, Dr. Adams Campbell, Dr. Paskett, Sheila, Jackie, thank you so much. Um, I think I, I think I say on behalf of the participants, we uh, we all learned so much and gained so much from this. Um, and um, I can't thank you enough. And hopefully we will see the other side of this pandemic soon. Um, we will, and um, and um, and all, I, I think you, you you made a good point. Everyone, go out and vote on November third. That's all I can say on that. So or that, early vote, early vote, vote. absentee yeah. vote, whatever vote. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, in New York, it starts September twenty fourth. Thank you so much, and have a good evening. <laughs>